Welcome back. The next panel is Policing the Virtual Town Square. And it's with great pleasure that I introduce today's speakers. Brian Barnes is a partner at Cooper & Kirk. He has litigated high stakes cases at all levels of the federal court system and has also argued numerous cases in state trial and appellate courts. He is representing the director of Florida's Department of Management Services in Net Choice v. Moody, a First Amendment and federal preemption challenge to a Florida law that regulates content moderation by social media platforms. Mr. Barnes presented argument for the defendants in the district court concerning a preliminary injunction that is the subject of a pending appeal in the 11th Circuit. He clerked for Justice Samuel Alito during the Supreme Court's 2012 term and was previously a law clerk to Judge Thomas Griffith of the DC Circuit. Antonio Garcia Martinez, you may see on your program, but he is not here on the stage. He could not be here today because of family obligations. Michael McConnell is the Richard and Francis Mallory Professor and Director of the Constitutional Law Center at Stanford Law School and a Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution. From 2002 to the summer of 2009, he served as a circuit judge on the United States Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit. Professor McConnell has held chair professorships at the University of Chicago and the University of Utah and visiting professorships at Harvard and NYU. He has published widely in the fields of constitutional law and theory, especially church and state, equal protection, and the founding. He served as law clerk to Supreme Court Justice William J. Brennan, Jr., and is of counsel to the appellate practice of Kirkland and Ellis. Chris Poplowski is the founder and CEO of Rumble, a full-service video platform and a website connecting creators to publishers and advertisers and helping them better monetize their work through a variety of distribution and licensing models. Jonathan Urich is not on the program, but we are very happy to have him today. He is Senior Counsel for Litigation at the U.S. Chamber Litigation Center, the litigation arm of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. In this capacity, Urich handles a variety of litigation matters for the Chamber. Before joining the Chamber, he practiced law with McGuire Woods in Richmond, Virginia, focusing on appeals and dispositive motions. He has clerked at all three levels of the federal judiciary, first in the Eastern District of Kentucky for Judge Amul Thapar, then at the Sixth Circuit for Judge Jeffrey Sutton, and finally at the U.S. Supreme Court for Justices Antoine Scalia and Clarence Thomas. Olivia Jackson is general counsel at the Oversight Board, which oversees Facebook's content moderation de decisions. Uh, please join me in welcoming our speakers this evening. Thanks. Jonathan, thank you for the thoughtful introductions and welcome to everyone joining us both in the room and also online. Um, I want to take a moment to thank our hosts, the Federalist Society, and particularly to thank uh, the students who have done all of the hard work in putting this event together for us all today. Um, we, we greatly appreciate it. We know it's a lot, a lot of work and a lot of effort on your part. Um, I'm delighted to have the honor of moderating this very impressive panel of speakers, um, each of whom brings a particular set of experiences and a perspective from uh, the arena of content moderation. Um, I'm hoping, I'm sure we will see a high level of engagement um, both on the panel and, and from our audience today. Um, in some sense, this topic needs no introduction or framing from a moderator. I think uh, Ted took my line earlier about never being far from the headlines. Um, this topic is very much in the headlines every day. How should we as a society handle online misinformation? How do we even define misinformation? Uh, what role does amplification play if we talk about the online town square, the equivalent of giving someone a loudspeaker in that square? Should Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act be reformed, and if so, how? And are there other regulatory avenues to affect change? Um, many, many questions. Uh, we may not have, I, I really doubt we'll have all of the answers, um, but we might have some insights as we all collectively sort of look, look for those answers together. So in preparing for this panel, the organizers asked us, um, asked our, our speakers to prepare some thoughts just as introductory remarks um, with two prompts. The first was, can private platforms effectively, uh, effectively moderate online speech? 
And then um, I might add to that the question of whether they should. And then secondly, whether and how state regulators should involve themselves. On the first of those questions in particular, I might look to Michael and Chris um, to offer some introductory thoughts. And then on the second, given their involvement in ongoing litigation, uh, Brian and Jonathan. But perhaps to start with, I can turn to Chris. Um, Chris, you, uh, if I read correctly online, Rumble recently announced it has 150 million um, monthly visits, and you're now one of the top 150 most visited sites in the United States. How do you think about these questions? First off, thank you for having me here today. Thanks to the Federal Society, and I look forward to uh, speaking to everyone today. Um, I'm going to pull back and give you kind of like a 10,000 foot overview of how we started and uh, the genesis of how Rumble became and where it is today. So I've been in the, the video space for over two decades now. Um, I started building sites when I was in high school. And I remember back in 2005, I got a message from someone saying, hey, check out this website. They're going to dominate. And at the time, he had like a top 50 website. And that website that he sent over to me was YouTube. And I was like, OK, let's see how this goes. Uh, two years later, in two, late 2006, uh, early 2007, Google acquired YouTube, as we all know. And it sucked up all the oxygen in the room in the video space. Um, they ended up uh, becoming the de facto video platform. And everybody else that created websites at the time kind of uh, went away. And they became the go-to place. <laughs> So it wasn't until about 2013 where I decided it was now time to get back into the video space. Um, I launched Rumble in 2013, and it was because of a few different reasons. One, and most importantly, we started seeing a deprioritization of content creators, specifically small creators, happen across all the incumbent platforms. And what that means is they started preferencing large media companies, influencers, multi-channel networks, and various other large brands instead of like our friends, aunts, uncles, et cetera. Um, and in 2013, I thought this was a real good opportunity to get in and really help that small creator market and bring them the same kind of tools that the larger platforms were giving them. Um, both on the distribution and the monetization. Additionally, what we also saw as, as an opportunity was uh, the management of that content and the content assets, giving the users choice in how they want to manage their IP. And that was the, the second component of Rumble that is kind of different than the, the incumbent platforms out there right now when it comes to managing uh, intellectual property and video assets. So we built this platform in 2013 thinking there was like going to be a, a huge exodus off the large platforms. It didn't really happen uh, to the extent that I thought in 2013. So fast forward to 2020, and everything kind of hits the fan at this point. Um, I remember getting a, a, a sign up at late 11 o'clock at night. I remember very specifically this moment. And it was of a congressman of the United States. And being a Canadian in Toronto, getting a sign up from a US congressman, you're like, whoa. Um, so we, I, am, I remember calling my colleague. I'm like, is this real? And uh, he's, he's like, yeah, I think this is real. Uh, next thing you know, we're on a call with this congressman. And he asks a simple question. He's like, if I bring my content to your platform and someone types in my name, are they going to be able to find it? And I'm like, yeah, that seems pretty normal. That's what should happen. He's like, OK. So he brings that content to our platform. And this is what happens. In three months, um, he accumulated over 300,000 subscribers on Rumble. And this is in 2020. In four years of being on YouTube, he only had 10,000 subscribers. And you know, that's, that's a pretty marked <coughs> major, major difference between two platforms. And when you look at that, you know, I remember our developers wondering, is this real? Is this, is this fake? Like, what's going on here? The barrier to entry on Rumble was that you had to sign up. You had to verify your phone number. And the barrier to entry on YouTube was like almost everybody has a Gmail account already. So it made no sense to us. And you know, from that point forward, we saw 
more congressmen, more congresswomen. We saw a lot of a lot of influencers start joining the platform, and this happened over and over and over again. Um, and it brings us to 2021. And in August, we've had the best month we've ever had um, this past August, uh, where we reached uh, nearly 35 million Americans and uh, globally much more. Um, and uh, we've become a, a pretty, pretty large video platform at this point. And, uh, you know, to answer the questions that, that, that Olivia posed is, uh, it, we're, we're, li we're living in a very interesting time. And what we've seen on Rumble and the growth that we've seen on Rumble, and the reason why we've seen growth on Rumble is, is, pretty, is pretty extraordinary. Um, that, that example I cited is an example that is happening across the board to every creator that come, not every creator, but most creators that come to Rumble. And why that's happening, you know, I don't know the exact reason. I have my, my guesses and, and thoughts. But uh, it's definitely happening, and it's something that uh, is allowing companies like Rumble to really uh, to have, have a lot of success in, in the market. So uh, that's the story of Rumble, and I really look forward to you know, tackling these questions um, and uh, speaking, speaking with you. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, if I may play hopscotch and kind of skip and go to Michael next. Thanks. Michael, could I ask you? Some thoughts. Uh, sure. Uh, do I have to turn this on? No. Uh, so, hello, and um, thanks to the Federalist Society to, for uh, uh, put it, doing all the work uh, on this, even though uh, the Con Law Center is a, a co sponsor as well. Uh, I think I'm here because I both teach the free speech and press and religion course at uh, Stanford Law School, but probably more so because of something Jonathan did mention in the introduction, which is that uh, about a, a little over a year ago, I became one of the uh, co-chairs of the new Facebook Oversight Board. Uh, and so uh, I'm going to talk about one model of uh, how to uh, regulate uh, social media, namely a self-regulatory uh, model. Before doing that, though, I just want to put it in the context of the various alternatives. Um, and I, I am not here to sell the oversight board. I think it's an experiment. And, you know, in a few years, we'll have some idea whether it worked well. I thought it was a promising enough idea to invest my time in it, so that tells you something. Uh, but mostly it seems as though the other alternatives all have very serious problems, and I just, uh, each of those would warrant a panel you know, unto themselves, uh, so I can't begin to s even scratch the surface. But, you know, but one possibility is just leave the companies to themselves. Let, let them run it uh, uh, you know, with whatever you know, sort of outside limitations of antitrust and, and fraud and so forth there might be. Um, the essential problem with that, I think, is the problem of incentives. This is something that we've become more aware of, that unlike companies that sell uh, products and services in the market, uh, the social media companies don't do that. That is, uh, users are not really their customers. The users don't pay anything. The pro the, what they get uh, is, uh, is for free, uh, and what they give is actually their eyeballs and their clicks. So what the companies are actually doing is selling their user base to a set of advertisers uh, and the advertisers have a different set of incentives than the users. And, the, and it, I think it's that uh, uh, disconnect between the uh, economic incentives of those driving the companies and the, uh, and, and the interests of the user base and perhaps of the society as a whole that is, uh, uh, that's the source of many of the discontents that are so obviously swirling around the, uh, uh, the, the companies today. Well, the most obvious next alternative is, uh, is, well, what about government regulation? Maybe the government can uh, decide, can, can regulate speech on the platform or, or regulate the platforms in there, you know, turn the platforms into the government's cat's paw for regulation of speech. And that might have all kinds of bad uh, consequences around the globe. Uh, 
Uh, governments are not always benign. Uh, uh, even in this country, governments may not be entirely benign. I, uh, I invite those of you who are uh, Republicans to think whether you really want an agency of the Biden administration deciding what people can say, and I invite people who are Democrats to think exactly the same uh, of the Trump administration. Uh, but this country, we might be able to get along with it, but we have a little problem, and that problem is called the First Amendment. Uh, and I think any serious form of content moderation would fall very, would very quickly uh, run afoul of the First Amendment. There are all kinds of things that social media companies do that are quite almost uncontroversial that would be unconstitutional if the First Amendment applied to what they were uh, doing. Um, uh, and so uh, it's very likely that for the government to take over the content moderation business would, would uh, lead to, uh, uh, to, to much worse uh, outcomes. Um, and if the government merely required the companies uh, to begin to regulate the company's own self-regulation of content moderation, the First Amendment is still going to kick in in two ways. One is that the companies themselves may have uh, First Amendment rights vis-a-vis -vis the government. Uh, that's a controversial proposition, but uh, seems uh, not implausible, depending upon how we conceptualize uh, the social media companies. But even beyond that, uh, as soon as the government is telling the companies how to regulate, then uh, that, may, that, that creates state action such that uh, the, the regular the speakers on the platforms then have a constitutional claim, uh, which gets us back into the, all the First Amendment problems. So, uh, I, I don't know, maybe there's some solutions to this, and my, it isn't my mission today to persuade you against government regulation, but uh, it seems to me there are some pretty insuperable problems uh, uh, to look at. Well, maybe government regulation takes the form of liberating trial lawyers to sue. Uh, this is uh, not impossible, and there are a lot of people who favor this, especially trial lawyers. Uh, and, uh, uh, but it's not clear that the First Amendment problems are avoided that way. It is clear that the courts are a slow, cumbersome, and expensive way to, an, uh, and not a, a nimble form of regulation. It's very unlikely that you would get uh, consistent, predictable results out of that, and consistency and predictability and rationality are among the um, features of constant content moderation that we most want. So what's, what's left? Well, one possibility, and again, I'm not arguing for it, but I'm engaged in that experiment uh, right now, is, uh, is to have uh, a form of industry self-regulation through uh, independent, some, some sort of an independent voice. And so what Facebook did uh, is that they created an oversight board uh, made up uh, currently of 20 uh, people from around the globe, uh, roughly uh, 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 f five of those being from the United States, but from every continent. Uh, quite diverse regionally and in terms of all the, uh, most of the other characteristics that we uh, think about when you uh, consider diversity and very distinguished people. Uh, I'm quite impressed with my colleagues. The board includes the former prime minister of Sweden, um, uh, of, um, excuse me, of Denmark, uh, a Nobel Pro Peace Prize winner, the 20-year uh, veteran editor of the, of the Guardian newspaper from from Britain, uh, can, uh, human rights activists from around the world, the dean of the what is probably the most prestigious uh, law school in Latin America, uh, uh, vice president of the Cato Institute, a very impressive uh, group of people, and uh, all of them having one characteristic in common, which is total independence of Facebook. None of them have any uh, direct connection with Facebook. They don't profit from it. Uh, and, and they may make uh, good decisions, they may make bad decisions, but, it, but they are not uh, driven by Facebook's own uh, economic interests. But rather, 
what they're trying to do, this is the, this is the, uh, the hope and the intention, is to uh, bring a greater degree of consistency and transparency and rationality uh, to the system, both by policing whether Facebook is conforming uh, to its stated principles and the community standards, uh, but also by making recommendations about uh, uh, improvements to those, both to the standards themselves, but also to the underlying regular uh, processes uh, by which the standards are implemented uh, within the company. Uh, I <laughs> just, it, it probably will come as no surprise to people who are more deeply uh, embedded in the Facebook world than I am. I'm not even on Facebook. Uh, uh, so uh, I, it may come as no surprise, but the, the, the degree of, uh, uh, of problems within the company are, and for, for one of the most profitable companies in the history of the world uh, to operate on such a shambolic basis is really pretty uh, astonishing uh, uh, to me. Uh, and. Uh, so, so how are we doing so far? We've been in operation for about a year. Uh, we now have uh, had uh, over half a million appeals from users uh, complaining of Facebook moderation decisions, uh, both takedowns and leave ups. Our original jurisdiction was just over takedowns, but it now extends to leave ups uh, uh, as well. Uh, there have been uh, 20 uh, uh, formal written uh, case decisions. You can look them up on the website. Uh, you know, they're full opinions. The whole point, the point being to uh, try to bring rationality and consistency and transparency so people can read those and people within Facebook read those and you see uh, uh, what's, uh, you know, what is the, the reasoning behind them. Uh, that is not, of course, the way Facebook or any of the other social media behave on their own. They make decisions and nobody has a clue uh, why. Oh, I, my, my account was suspended. Why was it suspended? I haven't, I, 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 don't, uh, I don't know. I mean, the, and the, and the uh, degree of irrationality is pretty high. My per would you hear my favorite anecdote? Um, my favorite anecdote is, is there's a fellow who is a Benjamin Franklin uh, impersonator. That is, he goes to schools and you know con conventions and conferences, and and he, you know he stands up in his Benjamin Franklin outfit and speaks like Benjamin Franklin, using Benjamin Franklin's own wor words and so forth. It's uh, he used to work at. Uh, at Colonial Williamsburg, uh, as both uh, Benjamin Franklin and, and uh, George Wythe. And, and he, he, his account on Facebook was canceled for inauthentic behavior. <laughs> <laughs> and he had no uh, recourse within the company. This is just an exam, just one, I think, amusing, but it wasn't amusing to him, his livelihood was destroyed. Right, but it's an example of, of irrationality. But having uh, people from the outside able to uh, uh, to look over Facebook's shoulder uh, is um, uh, is I think at least I don't know how big an impact it's going to be, but at least the impact might seem to be positive. So we've decided uh, 20 uh, uh, decisions with with written opinions. You can you can read them. I've actually assigned a few of those in my First Amendment class. Uh, uh, because I, I think they are, they are meaty and substantive. Uh, I think 13 of those 20 went against Facebook, uh, which is a pretty high number. But in addition to the 20, there have been, been uh, uh, over 60 policy recommendations about changes uh, that we uh, recommend that uh, Facebook make either in its standards or in, the w in their uh, ways of doing business. I should say, by the way, that Facebook is committed to carrying out the decisions of the board with respect to take, take out, leave ups or take downs. So we're the final word on that. They are only committed to, to public, uh, to, to receive and consider the recommendations and to announce publicly whether they are following them or not. Um, that's actually uh, more of a 
goad and a nudge than you might uh, think, uh, because uh, they don't look good when they uh, when we make an intelligent recommendation uh, and they say no. Uh, they have accepted and implemented uh, something like 34 of the recommendations, and there are others that are still in train that they're uh, considering. By the way, don't think, oh no, look at all the recommendations they aren't following. Some of the recommendations are probably not very good. Uh, and we are getting better, I think, uh, at crafting recommendations that are practical and implementable. Right, so don't, I don't actually blame them. For, some of them were just utopian, uh, and, uh, uh, and we'll get better, I hope, at, at our job. Um, now, I think the biggest complaint, the mo most justifiable complaint, is that you know, we're, we're uh, using a thimble to deal with a fire hydrant, and there's a lot of truth to that, uh, but I think my, my impression is that that thimble, those thimblefuls, uh, are having reverberations through the culture of the company, uh, and at least the hope is uh, that they will make a, a difference. And so, uh, and, when, and please note that when we talk about consistency and transparency, these are, th this is not the language of the First Amendment, but it is part of the values of the First Amendment because one of the most important things about the First Amendment is that we, people are treated the same way whether you like what they say or whether they, you don't like their say, what, what they say, and through a kind of rule of law. So that without importing the substantive content of the First Amendment, I like to think that the Oversight Board is introducing some of the sort of spirit and architecture of the First Amendment. Thank you. Michael, thank you for outlining some of the pros and cons um, of the different models and different approaches that we might take, including uh, the experiment of the oversight board. Um, Brian, if I move, may move to you next. Um, some states have chosen to, to at least attempt to intervene in this area. Um, could you talk to us a little bit about sort of some of the efforts with which you are involved? Sure. Yeah, thanks. And I'll... I'll uh preface my remarks by saying I, I represent the state of Florida in defending a law that uh, attempts to regulate uh, content moderation, but I, what I'll say here, I'm, I'm speaking for myself rather than uh, saying anything on, on behalf of the, the Florida defendants in that case. Um, and uh, let me start by just describing uh, at least one of the key provisions of the Florida law that, that uh, uh, regulates here, which is a, a provision that says essentially that uh, social media platforms are required to publicly disclose their content moderation standards, and then they're required to apply those standards, whatever they are, in a consistent manner. Uh, Florida was really the first state, it's a pioneer, in trying to regulate in this sphere. Uh, there was a law uh, that I, I think Jonathan is in, involved in challenging uh, uh, that the state of Texas passed uh, maybe a month or so back that uh, has a lot of similarities to the Florida law. One, one difference I'll point to, though, the, the, the Florida law does not limit the ability of uh, social media platforms to have viewpoint-based rules. Uh, you could have a, 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 a policy in, as a social media platform that says, we're going to take down all of the posts about denying the existence of the Holocaust, and we're going to leave up the posts that talk about the Holocaust otherwise. Um, at least as I understand it, I, I think the Texas law goes a bit further in that regard and, and uh, prohibits viewpoint discrimination in the, the content moderation policies that uh, platforms are permitted to have. Um, so uh, this is a law that uh, uh, Florida tried to, uh, to, to bring into effect uh, at the beginning of July of this year. Uh, it, was, it was enjoined, it was challenged by a, a group of uh, trade associations representing uh, the, the social media platforms uh, it was enjoined by the Northern District of Florida and is now up on appeal in the 11th Circuit. Um, let, me, let me talk about uh, what I think of as kind of the, the two key legal ch challenges or theories on which this type of regulation is, is being challenged. And um, I guess the, the punchline or the thesis that I want to leave you with is that uh, this, these legal questions are hard questions and it's not clear what the outcome is going to be. I, I think when uh, Florida's law, and, and uh, maybe to a somewhat lesser degree, Texas's law was first enacted, 
the, the general commentary suggested, oh, well, the, the lawyers for these states are just going to be laughed out of court. But, but my thesis here is that these are closer legal questions than uh, was, was I, I guess, initially suggested. Uh, so the first big challenge uh, that uh, folks who don't think that this type of uh, regulation, at least at the state level, is permissible, raises is, is Section 230. And um, a, a few observations about that federal statute. One is that uh, it's surprising how sparse the case law is on the meaning of Section 230 and its application to scenarios where what you're dealing with is situations where someone is objecting to the fact that the social media platform has taken content down rather than leaving it up. So the, the classic scenario where Section 230 comes up is, uh, and, and has come up you know, repeatedly in the courts is where somebody posts some kind of defamatory material on Facebook or some other platform, and then the person who is the victim of the defamation sues the platform saying, hey, you, you left this up when you should have taken it down. And there, uh, there's relatively robust case law that, that gives the social media platforms pretty broad protection. Uh, the scenario that hasn't come up much and, and um, really didn't come up often before the Florida and Texas laws went into effect is a situation where you have a platform removing content that uh, someone has posted and the poster says, well, you, you improperly took it down. You, you should have been compelled to, to leave it up. There, uh, there's some broad dicta in some cases that suggests that platforms uh, are, are also entitled to, to broad protection, but it's dicta because, um, it, you know, and, and part of the reason for the, the sparseness of the case law in this area is if you just think about what's the cause of action uh, that you would have as someone who's aggrieved by the fact that your material was taken down, there's not a common law cause of action like you have with defamation, right? And so that um, drives the fact that even though this statute has been around for decades now, uh, there's relatively little uh, case law that are square holdings, for, and certainly at the, at the appellate level, that specifically speaks to uh, the scope of Section 230's protections. Uh, two other big unknowns, um, questions that probably won't be resolved, at least I don't expect, in the litigation over the Florida and Texas laws, but that's, that are super important. One is uh, at least certain forms of Section 230 protection only apply when the social media platform acts in, quote, good faith. We don't know what it means for a platform to act in good faith. That's a, a question on which very few courts have opined. Another is uh, certain forms of protection under Section 230 only kick in when the uh, platform deems content to be within uh, a, a, uh, one of a, a series of categories of speech that uh, Section 230, the text of Section 230 purports to protect. And the, the last in this list of categories of speech uh, is, is this phrase, otherwise objectionable. And there's a big question about, well, when, we, when the statute uses that phrase, otherwise objectionable, is it uh, basically giving the platforms free license to take down any content that they object to? Or uh, do we need to look at the other terms in that list, which uh, all of which are, are content-based categories, but not viewpoint-based categories, and, and think that this phrase, otherwise objectionable, only applies to situations unlike with the Texas law, where uh, a platform is removing content not because of the viewpoint that's being expressed, but because of uh, the, maybe the subject matter of the, of the content. So that's, that's Section 230 uh, at a very high level. Uh, there's also the First Amendment, uh, which, and I, I think Professor McConnell uh, made reference to the fact that there's uh, a question mark uh, hanging over uh, whether social media platforms have First Amendment protection when they're engaged in content moderation. Um, so the, the sort of two key cases in this area, uh, one, the, 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 the case that my side of this debate likes is Rumsfeld against FAIR. Uh, that's a case where a group of law schools wanted to exclude military recruiters from um, law school recruiting events uh, because of the military's don't ask, don't tell policy. Uh, Congress had passed a law that said uh, no, it, to the extent you grant anyone uh, as a recruiter uh, access to your law school, you have to also give equal access to the military. Uh, the law schools challenged that, saying basically that their um, First Amendment rights were being violated by the fact that they weren't permitted to control the sort of blend of uh, speech that was hosted on the law school campus. And uh, that got up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said 
by a vote of eight to nothing uh, that uh, no, the law schools do not have uh, a First Amendment interest there because the uh, decision about what uh, speakers to host in the context of a recruiting event is uh, not something that implicates the free speech rights of the law schools. Um, on the other side of the ledger, the case that I'm sure Jonathan likes uh, is uh, Ternillo against uh, the Miami, Miami Herald. Uh, that's a case about uh, the editorial rights uh, of a newspaper. Uh, newspapers, according to this case, are entitled to decide which articles to run, which editorials to, to place in their, in their pages. And um, one of the sort of interesting features of this area of the law is there's, uh, I think both sides are sort of proceeding by analogy. Is content moderation more like uh, hosting a, a, a law school job recruiting event, or is it more like uh, publishing a newspaper? And, um, you know, query to what extent uh, there's uh, an easy way or a, a logical way of really answering that question uh, simply by proceeding by analogy, but I'll just flag a few of our points about why uh, content moderation is different from uh, publishing a newspaper. One is newspapers have physical space limitations, right? If you think about the two and a half billion uh, profiles that are available on Facebook uh, all over the world and compare that to the limited space that's available to a newspaper, that's that's an important difference, potentially. And when the government mandates that you publish an article in a newspaper, that means maybe you can't publish some other article that you don't want to pub publish. Requiring Facebook to host content doesn't have the same effect on Facebook's ability to uh, host other content. Um, another difference is, again, thinking about that, those two and a half billion uh, profiles uh, that are up on Facebook. Um, if you think about the blend of profiles that Facebook hosts, what collectively are those profiles expressing? Um, you know, I think that the typical viewer or observer of a random Facebook profile doesn't think, oh, this is Facebook, uh, that this is content that Facebook has, has, has endorsed or that it's expressing. In contrast with a newspaper, uh, there's uh, much more selective uh, action on the part of newspaper editors who are picking and choosing very carefully which articles to run, and the, the, the newspaper is uh, something that you can pick up and read cover to cover, and if the newspaper is done well, then the material in the paper will uh, hopefully express something or reflect the, uh, a viewpoint or, or a broad uh, theme that the editors of the paper want to speak to. Uh, it's not the same when you're talking about uh, the, the huge volume of material that's hosted by these largest um, social media platforms. Um, so that's another difference with a newspaper. And then the, the last thing I'll do uh, just in a very kind of thumbnail way is a, another sort of issue, even if you get past this question of, uh, well, does the First Amendment apply at all when you're talking about content moderation where a, a platform is just deciding what material to host, uh, there's a, a further question about the regulatory classification of some of these larger social media platforms as common carriers. Um, there's a, a, a ton that could be said there, but um, just in, in, in very brief, um, there's some pretty good Supreme Court authority uh, and, and certainly the D.C. Circuit's opinion on net neutrality from a few years ago uh, that uh, basically says that common carriers have much diminished uh, First Amendment interests. And so can a state, as Florida and Texas have attempted to do, can a state come in and classify some of these larger media, uh, social media platforms as common carriers the same way we, we do, say, the phone company? Uh, and, uh, you know, obviously the phone company is subject to certain requirements. They can't cut off the phone service of someone because they don't like uh, the, the positions that the, the particular user of the phone service mm -hmm. takes. Um, and can uh, states like Florida and Texas classify these social media platforms in the same way as common carriers and in that way get around uh, restrictions that the First Amendment would otherwise impose. So those are, uh, that's a, a sketch of some of the legal issues. I, I'm sure Jonathan will disagree with me about everything, but uh, uh, th there it is to try to at least set the, st the table for discussion. Brian, thank you for that whistle stop tour of the sort of kind of legal framework. Uh, jo Jonathan, do you disagree about everything? <laughs> uh, pretty much. Um, <laughs> before I jump into my remarks, just one small amendment to my bio. I am currently no longer with the U.S. Chamber. I am now Clayton Kaczynski's colleague 
at Lahotsky Keller, and in that capacity, I am uh, representing the very same trade associations that Brian mentioned, just in the Texas litigation, not in the Florida litigation. So um, my firm is challenging on their, the trade association's behalf um, Texas's new law, and so. I'm admittedly less interested for our purposes right now about you know whether content moderation is a good idea or whether you know a sort of private model of sort of self-regulation is a good idea. I'm more interested in whether the government just has any role to play whatsoever in in regulating how social media companies moderate content on their platforms. And I think um, as no one will be surprised, my view is absolutely not. The government has no role to play whatsoever. In moderating, in regulating how private social media platforms moderate content, um, under the First Amendment, the government has no authority um, to regulate that. And as we know from the Supreme Court's decision in Reno versus ACLU, the the internet is not a First Amendment free zone. The operators of websites and apps have just as strong free speech rights as any other offline speaker. And beyond that, we know that the First Amendment right to free speech includes the right to disseminate and distribute content. There are a bunch of Supreme Court cases that say that. And, but that's precisely what the social media platforms do. They're disseminating and they're distributing content. And so thus, as a result, they have a constitutional right against being compelled to disseminate or distribute content that violates their editorial standards. That's the right of editorial control. And, and that right uh, is well established in a bunch of Supreme Court cases. Brian mentioned Tornillo. There's another case called PG&E. And there's also, of course, Hurley, which involved a parade. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. But basically, what these cases, I think, establish is that all speakers, but especially speakers that collect, curate, present, and distribute content created by others, have a First Amendment right to editorial discretion in how they present that content to others. Hurley is really, really important. I actually think Hurley is even a more powerful case than Tornillo because Hurley involved a parade of all kinds of different disparate messages where the Supreme Court basically acknowledged that the parade as a whole had no sort of coherent theme or message. The only, other than, the only real coherent message was that all these disparate messages included in the parade were, quote, worthy of presentation. That was the expressive interest conveyed by the parade as a whole. And the Supreme Court said that forcing the parade organizers to include another message, other participants, would interfere with that message, even though there was no sort of common you know, uh, theme or message at a, at a more precise level of generality other than everything included in this parade is worthy of presentation. And so Hurley, I think, stands for the proposition that presenting even extremely diverse collections of other people's content is constitutionally protected. And so the First Amendment protects these collections even if the content completely disagrees with each other about, you know, about the topics addressed or has no consistent or overarching theme. And so editing and curating and presenting these collections of diverse content, what it does is it creates new speech by the editors. It becomes the editors, the collection itself becomes the editor's new speech that conveys the editor's distinct expressive message. Now, of course, it's at a higher level of generality than the specific messages of all, of all the included content. But like, like Hurley acknowledged, that, that higher level message is that this content is worthy of presentation, or to elaborate just a little bit further, it's, it's socially desirable, and it's appropriate for, in the editor's view, it's appropriate for the specific audience that the editors have in mind. Um, and that higher level message, in my view, is just as constitutionally protected as any other lower level, more specific message of the speaker's content. It's just like any other message, just it's more abstract. And Justice Thomas even recognized this 25 years ago in a concurrence in a case called Denver Area Educational Telecommunications Consortium. I know that's a mouthful, but the, the precise statutes and stuff that were involved in Denver Area were a little complicated. But what Justice Thomas said was that the government cannot force the editor of a collection of essays, as an example, to print other essays on the same subject. And he went on in Denver Area to discuss 
how cable operators, the cable operators' interest in editorial discretion trumps the First Amendment rights of contributors, content producers that send their content over, that are transmitted, sort of, that the cable operators present to customers. And so just like Justice Thomas's comment about a collection of essays, I think the government, I think it's pretty indisputable and uncontroversial to say that the government, for example, couldn't compel editors to include content on an op-ed page that includes completely diverse and contradictory perspectives. That's Tornillo, right? Or an encyclopedia that covers the whole gamut of human you know, affairs and views. Or in an academic journal that addresses all kinds of different various subjects and different contradictory perspectives. Or a community newsletter that, that takes submissions on everything imaginable from the community. So let's, let's take that for example. Imagine a community newsletter for a town or an HOA like mine. I live in this big HOA, growing HOA in Maryland. You'd be shocked, you, many of you probably know, but I was shocked when I moved to the suburbs just how much drama actually is, is in, the, uh, in the suburbs. But so imagine there's an HOA newsletter or town newsletter that curates submissions from readers on literally anything. It could be you know, local or global or national politics. It could be religion, you know, professional romantic gossip sports, events, neighbors' yards, whatever, right? So imagine, you know, imagine this newsletter. But the editors of the newsletter, even though it has no consistent theme or subject matter in common, they want to exercise some editorial discretion and you know, keep out content that they think is inappropriate, offensive, or just not appropriate for their specific audience. I, I think it would be sort of beyond debate that their right to editorial control over this hodgepodge newsletter would be constitutionally protected. I think that's, that's pretty indisputable. But all social media platforms are just gigantic global versions of this newsletter where the community is the whole world. And so I don't think the size of the platform can make a constitutional difference to the analysis. The platforms exercise their editorial discretion, just like in this hypothetical community newsletter, to curate user submissions, to present content that the editors consider worthy of engagement and appropriate for each platform's community of users. And so in, in, in that way, the social media platforms send the exact same constitutionally protected message as the editors of any other protected collection of content that I, that I ticked off earlier. And size just cannot be dispositive, I think. Size and diversity of viewpoints when there's a curated collection of speech just cannot diminish the constitutional rights of the editors. And nor can market power. So, so Tornillo expressly holds that market power can make no difference to this analysis. If you have a newspaper and you think they're a monopoly, there's one, constitution, there's one tool that's completely constitutionally off the table, and that's compelling editors to include content in a collection of speech that they don't want to include. There are other tools the government has, so I'll point you back to the panel right before us, like the, the antitrust laws. If you think there's a market power problem, the Supreme Court has said, use the antitrust laws or other tools. The one tool the government doesn't have is compelling editors to include speech in a collection that they don't want. And so there's maybe one minor exception that's not even really an exception. It's a case called Turner Broadcasting System, TBS versus FCC, where there was a monopoly problem, but it was paired with physical, a choke point problem over the physical infrastructure over the cable lines. So with the Supreme Court, and TBS versus Turner involved the must carry rules requiring the cable companies to carry broadcast stations content. And, and what the Supreme Court said was it wasn't just the monopoly problem, it was the monopoly problem plus the physical choke point problem where the cable operators had the ability to block the broadcast channels from ever reaching millions of Americans, and given the technology at the time, there were no really other available alternatives to get that content out there. They said that that combination justified the must-carry rules. And I think that the, the social media context is just completely disanalogous because, you know, as the Supreme Court has told us in Reno, the internet's basically a virtually limitless, cheap, resource to get speech out there. There's, there's tons of other available avenues to get speech out there.
beyond, you know, if, if for whatever reason the social media platforms don't want to carry certain speech. And even Justice Thomas, and he has a great concurrence in Fox versus FCC where he just absolutely takes down the fairness doctrine as completely unconstitutional. But in that case, in that concurrence, he also notes that dramatic technological advances can completely change the, the constitutional analysis. And one of the things he notes is widespread, cheap internet access just completely changes the constitutional analysis and eviscerates the whatever policy case there might have been for the fairness doctrine. And I think that's similar here. There's just so many other avenues for to get speech out there that it cannot possibly justify regulating uh, how social media companies moderate content. And so make no mistake, in my view, government regulation of how social media companies moderate content is nothing short of a 21st century fairness doctrine that's just as constitutionally dubious. And nor do I think does characterizing social media platforms as common carriers make any constitutional difference either. And this too, I think Justice Thomas in his Denver area concurrence is really uh, instructive where he, he basically said this. He said, quote, a common carrier scheme has no real First Amendment consequences, end quote. And he went on to say, sorry, that imposing a form of common carrier obligation can justify a law that, quote, burdens the constitutionally protected speech rights of some to expand the speaking opportunities of others. This is Justice Thomas 25 years ago saying this. So I think the common carrier label just does not matter and we just ignore the label and we just do the normal, ordinary First Amendment compelled speech analysis and for the reasons I discussed, I think it's, we just ask, does the common carry, the, the label of common carrier obligation, does it interfere with private speech rights? And I think the answer is pretty clear that regulating how social media platforms moderate content would interfere with those speech rights. Because when the common carrier obligation requires the inclusion of unwanted content in a curated collection of speech, it just violates the First Amendment period full stop. And I think Hurley is, again, really instructive on this point. Hurley specifically held that the one thing the government can't do through an equal access statute or anti-discrimination law is convert the collection of speech, a speaker's collection of speech itself, into a public accommodation. You can't, that's the one thing you can't do. And I think that's functionally exactly what a common carrier obligation would do for social media, regulate, for, for social media platforms. And so creating a more balanced or you know, social discourse or leveling the marketplace of ideas, these are just not legitimate government interests as the Supreme Court has held in, in a bunch of different cases. And just to wrap up, to address the two other cases, so Rumsfeld versus Fair, and, and there's another case that Brian didn't mention called Pruneyard about access to a mall, for speaker access to a mall where the Supreme Court upheld a California constitutional rule that required private malls to allow speakers on their property. I think both of these cases are completely distinguishable. So the law in Rumsfeld versus Fair was, I think, a garden variety anti-discrimination law about something that was not speech. So the, the law at issue there required colleges and universities to allow military recruiters on campus on the exact same terms that they would allow private employers to recruit on campus. But this is no different, I think, from anti-discrimination laws about hiring or housing or anything like that. The, you know, allowing physical access to campus to recruit on equal terms is not speech, just like hiring isn't speech and renting, house, renting apartments isn't speech. But the Supreme Court has made super clear that under those sort of otherwise constitutional anti-discrimination laws, you can be compelled to say certain things or prevented from saying certain things. You know, under the anti-discrimination laws, as the court noted in FAIR, you know, a business can be prohibited from putting up a sign that says, you know, white applicants only. That's an incidental speech restriction that's a consequence of an otherwise constitutional regulation of conduct, not speech. And I think Pruneyard is distinguishable for the exact same reason, that this, for the Supreme Court said, Hosting speakers on the mall's property doesn't feel, uh, uh, interfere with the mall's speech. It doesn't compel speech to be included in the mall's speech because the, the mall just operating you know, a forum for businesses to sell products and services isn't speech. 
So I think those cases are sort of easily distinguishable. And so just to repeat, sort of when, despite contradictory messages within a curated collection of speech, an extremely diverse collection of speech, that collection becomes new speech by the platform's editors conveying the editor's own higher level message about what speech is worthy of presentation, what's socially desirable, and what's appropriate for their audience. And that message is distinct from the particular messages of the included content in the collection. And because the First Amendment protects that higher level message just as much as any other message, I think it, you know, it's pretty clear that uh, government regulation of, of social media content moderation would be unconstitutional. Jonathan, thank you for that in-depth response and kind sorry, of detail I, of sorry the if I went case law. No, no. <laughs> um, I'm going to pick up on a term you use. So you talked about hodgepodge newsletters where the audience is the whole world. Um, perhaps then uh, picking up on something Michael mentioned about the sort of underlying values. I mean, you, you and Brian have both spoken about the um, uh, American law. Like, would it would it be possible to create a global set of rules? To what extent is it desirable to create a global set of rules? Chris, your company headquartered in Canada, I think now in Canada and the U.S. Um, how 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 might you think about that? Yeah, the the different jurisdictions make it uh, quite different and difficult for for companies like us. Um, in Canada, there's a, a different set of responsibilities than there are in the United States for us. Uh, for example. We have uh, hate speech laws in Canada, whereas in uh, the United States, I, I don't believe that to be the case. So um, the responsibilities that we, we have as a platform being headquartered in Canada uh, make it, uh, we, we have to abide by these laws within the jurisdiction that we are in. And this changes from country to country to you know, continent to continent. Uh, and you know, grappling and trying to understand the laws of every single country and having the platform kind of adhere to every single law and every single different language um, for a company that, you know, a startup is almost impossible. It is impossible. It's a, it, it's a responsibility that, you know, no one could really undertake on day one. So in, in terms of uh, Rumble, per se, we, we've really kind of only focused on the English markets. We're, we're focused in the United States. We're focused on Canadian law. And we, we, we take on the responsibility to follow the laws in uh, each of those jurisdictions. But outside of that, you know, as we expand and as we grow, um, we'll be able to, to address these different markets. But that, that's, that's a really good question. There's different laws in different jurisdictions, and abiding by them for companies like us is extremely difficult. Michael, um, you noted at the outset your sort of global colleagues on the oversight board. Um, how, how have you thought, have some of the standards sort of developed as you've been thinking about your decisions? Um, this is a real challenge uh, because, I mean, as Chris was just saying, even United States and Canada, two countries with remarkably similar cultures, the laws uh, uh, can be different. Uh, in the first instance, uh, you, know, you know, Facebook does comply with uh, with legal requirements in all the jurisdictions. And if, if Chris thinks it's hard in two, I'm, I'm sure it's even harder. We have nothing to do with that. We didn't, the oversight board does not uh, overrule. Facebook decides how to comply with the various jurisdictions, and uh, we don't have anything uh, uh, to say about that. So putting the laws aside, uh, nonetheless, there are you know customs and and ways of doing things that are quite different uh, around the world. And Facebook has taken the position and still does uh, that it is that it has the same standards for everywhere. Uh, and uh, whether that's a good uh, that that's something at some point I think the oversight board is probably going to have to grapple with is whether that's as a policy. Uh, uh, appropriate because uh, there are a number of uh, controversies that arise that are very specific to the cultures uh, uh, involved, uh, and uh, but but currently that is the the, the rule, and uh, the oversight board is charged under the terms of its charter with enforcing uh, international human rights uh, standards. Uh, 
uh, on the platform. You might think, well, you know, what's international law got to do with this? International law applies to governments, and and, and that's true. But uh, the there is a, a a statement on responsibilities of private corporations to which Facebook has voluntarily subscribed. So it, it is not that international law is sort of getting its claws into Facebook, it's that Facebook is committed to following these uh, uh, principles with respect to private businesses that are a part of, uh, of international law. So, you know, a lot of what we do is in the idiom of international law, and myself as a U.S. constitutional lawyer, I'm constantly interested in and, and informed by uh, the differences. Uh, many people think that the differences between international law norms and U.S. norms are, uh, you know, are this big. Um, I, th I mean, they are certainly significant, but it's more like this big. Uh, sometimes uh, U.S. law does the same thing that international uh, human rights law does, only under a different. Uh, uh, you know, think, you know, with different vocabulary and, and sort of looking as if it's coming in a different place. Take hate speech, uh, which Chris also uh, mentioned. You in the U.S., we do not have a separate doctrine of hate speech, right? And so, and it's not a it's not a legal category actually in, under U.S. law. Uh, and there are even some Supreme Court opinions that strongly imply that it could not be. But what do we have? We have laws against threats. We have laws against incitement. Uh, we have laws against uh, uh, most of the areas of hate speech that actually lead to concrete harms against uh, uh, against people. So it's not, I'm not saying that it's identical, but the difference is not as uh, dramatic. Uh, but the dealing with the way in which these uh, these these sort of commonly stated principles apply in the particular cultural context around the world is a real is a real challenge. So Chris, I recommend just stay in North America. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I want to make sure we do leave time for questions from the audience. We got started a bit late, but I think as I look at it, we're coming up on time. Um, so could I ask if audience members do have questions that they start to move towards the, the microphone, and when you do speak, please, um, if I could ask you to identify yourselves first and keep your questions brief um, to allow time. Thank you, we'll start, start on my, my left, your right. Hi, my name is Mackenzie Austin, I'm a 3L at Stanford Law. Regarding pl platforms' arguable speech protections, do you think that there's a principled doctrinal distinction to be made between human-generated uh, content moderation and algorithmic content moderation? Is that a question? For, I think it's a question for me, probably. Good. So I think uh, <laughs> the answer, in my view, is no, absolutely not. And the re here's the reason why, is the algorithms are programmed by human beings. And they're programmed by human beings to reflect the editor's editorial judgments and values about what speech they want to present on their platforms and what speech they think is socially desirable and what speech they think is appropriate for their users. So, and make no mistake, by the way, those algorithms are applied the minute you, the second you post. There's multiple layers of review. On, on the platforms, but the algorithms are applied immediately. And so they are applying their editorial judgment to all posts right away. And because those algorithms reflect editorial discretion, I think they're equally constitutionally protected. Let me disagree. Uh, <laughs> please. So I guess my answer is I need to know more about the algorithm. Um, and, and the reason I say that is, uh, Think about two, this is a gross oversimplification, obviously, of what actually happens, but think about two types of algorithms. One is an algorithm that humans designed to try to elect Joe Biden, right? And the algorithm is, you know, it's trying to, through whatever the process is, maximize the appeal of Joe Biden to the viewer. So that's, that's one type of algorithm. Imagine another algorithm that simply says, show the material in alphabetical order, okay? 
show the material alphabetical order. I'm not sure that that is speech, even though it's, it's organizing information, I'm not sure that it's speech on the part of the platform. And what kind of algorithm do we actually have with these platforms? I, I think it's probably somewhere in between the, those two extremes. And so uh, this is one of the, the ways in which, you know, Jonathan's clients don't want to, but I think we need to get into the facts and the, the nitty gritty details of the way these algorithms work because that could actually turn out to be really important to whether the First Amendment protects them. I'm going to exercise my power as moderator and intervene before we turn to another question, which is, no, Chris, please. I'd be interested to hear, how do, how do these algorithms work? Right? Law lawyers <laughs> try to figure it out all day long. Um, I, I think the algorithms are a root of, of a lot of the problems right now. Uh, one of the things that we're doing is we're trying to stay away from these algorithms that sort content. I think that is a type of editorial control that we haven't seen before. And the fact that none of us know how any of these things work um, makes it even uh, more suspicious. Like, for example, these algorithms are designed to, to amplify content, and th they're, the way that they amplify content are, is based on engagement. So people are making content in, in a way that are, is quite disingenuous. They keep adding different titles, different thumbnails. This amplifies it, gets to more people. It goes to millions and millions of people. And I think this is the root of all the problem. Uh, I think we need, you know, at Rumble, we're, we're focused on just keeping things chronological uh, in terms of the timeline, not amplifying content to try to, to, try to drive profits. And I, I really believe that this amplification and editorial control through these algorithms is, is a big problem. Thank you. Question from over here. Yes, uh, hi, my name is Ryan Long. I'm a Stanford Law School fellow and tech attorney. Um, I had a question for the panel about Section 230. Uh, as written, it makes an exception for copyright infringement um, so or trademark infringement. If stuff is posted on Facebook and it's infringing, uh, Section 230 doesn't protect uh, the company from keeping it up. My question for you is, what do you think about some of the proposals that have been proposed to basically allow for defamation, for instance, like if there's a court order uh, stating that there's defamatory content on Facebook and for the court order to uh, be respected by Facebook, that's one proposal. What do you think about some of the um, basically ideas of kind of chipping away at some of this stuff so that it doesn't allow harmful content such as defamation to remain um, on Facebook or Twitter? Many proposals for Section 230 reform. Brian, if I can ask you to Take a first pass at that question. Sure, yeah, I mean, I guess, uh, you know, I confess that I've spent more time thinking about the issue of when social media platforms ought to be able to be sued for removing content as opposed to leaving it up as what you have with uh, defamation. I mean, I guess one thing I would say is I, I think it's important to go back to the original kind of animating purpose of Section 230 in, in thinking about this stuff. and. Um, the, the origin of it was a, a New York State trial court opinion uh, from back in the 90s where basically the, um, the, the, the platform of its day had been sued for basically holding itself out as a, a family-friendly place that you could go on the internet, but then nevertheless uh, leaving content up uh, sort of through inadvertence uh, that uh, you know, was problematic. And what the court said was basically if you didn't engage in content moderation at all, then uh, you couldn't be sued. But because you hold yourself out this way, the, the law of defamation comes in and uh, you can be held, a, held to account for this user post that you didn't remove. And Congress uh, sort of recognizing the, the, the consequences of that for the fact that Section 230, or the fact that um, these platforms inevitably are going to be imperfect in their content moderation, it, it enacted Section 230. And so I guess my own thought on, um, you know, the advisability of carving out a defamation exception to Section 230 is I, I actually do think that the, the statute has a, 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 a sort of a proper role to play in that context. I mean, I, I guess I'd want to see at least some guardrails around making sure that, you know, invariably when a mistake is made, that that doesn't uh, immediately lead to, to, to defamation liability for the platform. Thank you. Thank Any, you. Go 
Hi, uh, thanks for the interesting panel. Uh, I have a question mainly for Brian, I guess. Um, so from the news, I understand that the Florida law has an exemption if you own a theme park in the state of Florida. Uh, and I was wondering if you could explain a bit the rationale behind that, and also if that's broadly consistent with the spirit of the First Amendment to have different speech protections based on what property you own. Uh, so I just defend the law. I, d I didn't write it. Uh, <laughs> You know, I guess a couple of thoughts on that. Number one, um, the kind of problems that are animating the, the Florida law um, are problems that at least I haven't seen any evidence uh, to, to show that uh, theme parks or theme park owners are engaged in the kind of sort of problematic uh, discrimination uh, that uh, you see among sort of the big uh, social media platforms out there that, that everybody's familiar with. The other thing I'd say is um, to the extent you think that that provision of the, the Florida law is constitutionally problematic, it's severable. There's a severability clause in the Florida law. And so, um, you know, that's the solution to that problem. It's not to invalidate the whole dang law. Thank you. Um, next. I think is also from, from my left. Yeah, hi, I'm uh, Don Falk, uh, private lawyer in, in the area, uh, Mayor Brown. Good to see some familiar faces up there. And uh, I, I think I'll pick, on, uh, I'll pick on John first, but I think sure. anybody can, can, can jump in. Um, I'm going to hide behind the Talmudic, some would say, uh, to avoid uh, displeasing any clients or potential clients out there. But some would say that there is a, a tension between an absolute, you know, second or third order constitutional right to arrange content and a complete absence of liability, no matter how intense and, you know, seemingly granular those choices are, setting aside whether there's a bias one way or another, I think it's undeniable that the major content platforms are uh, increasingly policing content. Uh, uh, provided by other people, and then I think, you know, I, I think at least that that is, that is certainly First Amendment activity, and I think it's protected by the First Amendment, uh, but there seems to me to be a real policy tension there when there are, uh, is uh, what amounts to be, or I should say it seems to some that there is a policy tension, and I think undeniably a tension when there's no possible liability even for those choices that might otherwise fall outside the First Amendment's protection. Um, and I also, uh, the second part question, some of this, um, again, prompted by something John said about common carrier, and I, you know, certainly the, the First Amendment doesn't end to where common carrier regulation begins. Uh, however, uh, there would, again, seem to be a, a tension between, you know, the real concept of common carriage, if you're, all you are is pipes, it's one thing, and that's, you're a common carrier, and your rights may be somewhat limited, and you may not be somewhat limited. But is the real question whether, whether and how common carriage, um, or is an A question, whether, whether and how common carriage requirements should be imposed uh, in the absence of you know, a so-called natural monopoly. Many of us are old enough to have seen many natural monopolies uh, evolve away despite their supposed natural status. Uh, or, you know, maybe is there something, something more there um, when you have a genuine common carrier? Maybe, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe the, the rights and responsibilities aren't quite so um, consistent with, with uh, you know, again, complete absence of responsibility or regulation. And they might be in, you know, the current situation where you certainly have what I think is just what would be a, a rough and tough uh, application of common carriage law where you have it's really an editorial function. Um, and I'll stop there and see what, see, uh, what if anything that sparks. So it's admittedly a lot to chew on. Um, so I think I'm going to cop out a little bit on the first part, which is like if there is a tension between, I think obviously Don's referring to, I think 230 and any policy tension with the First Amendment, if that is a tension, like he acknowledged it's a policy one, not a legal one, and I think that, you know, um, I'll leave it to sort of others to, to uh, opine on whether, you know, that tension is a good idea or a bad idea, but I think, 
you know, my, my ultimate concern is, is the First Amendment trumps, and the, uh, the First Amendment provides pretty robust protections for the reasons I described, pretty robust protections for platform content moderation. Um, I will say on, on uh, just to elaborate a little more on common carriers, I think just as a matter of fact, even, even though I don't think the common carrier label changes the constitutional analysis whatsoever, I just think as a factual matter, the platforms just objectively are not common carriers. They do not purport to be open to all comers and all views, which I think is the core common law, you know, historical understanding of a common carrier, and they never have. They never have since they, since they started. Um, they just never have purported to, to fit that bill to just be transmitting sort of like passive conduits of other people's speech. They've, they've never purported to be that. I mean, if you even look at Facebook, I mean, I've, I've gone back to Facebook's terms of service from like before they even, you know, opened up to the public generally beyond, you know, high school and college students and they prohibited hate speech all the way back then long before they became a two billion user company. So this, none, this isn't new. Um, and, you know, I don't think any of the, you know, the, the degree of moderation may or may not have changed. I, you know, we can talk about that, but I, I don't think there's ever been a time where the, the social media platforms haven't, haven't moderated content to at least some degree or another. I think, I, I don't want to say this for sure, but my, my, my strong intuition is that they, what probably happened is it arose from custom, that, right? That that's how a lot of the common law developed, right? Is that, you know, sort of different industries so, sort of were regarded as, you know, just developed a custom of being open to all comers and, and that custom then took on legal effect as reflected in the common law. And I don't think there is any, like I said, I don't think they're just as a factual matter, I don't think there is any such custom historically for, for the social media platforms, even though they're obviously relatively new, but I don't think there is any such you know, pattern or history of being open to all, all speech and all users. I, if I might just jump in, I don't think the big question is where the restrictions came from, how they arose, but whether they have an all comers status, that is, common carriers require, uh, eliminate discrimination. And when you pick, when the telephone, you pick up the telephone, you have a right to speak. You can even engage in criminal conspiracies over the, you can criticize COVID vaccination over the telephone, and the telephone company can't do anything about it. It's an all comers thing, but nobody, I think, is proposing that for the uh, social media companies. It's not that you can, it's not that you, you should be able to use these carriers to say whatever you want. It's everybody seems to agree that there's going to be an extraordinarily complicated uh, 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 a set of restrictions. That's not what common carriers are. If I could just react uh, to, to that, sure. one one thing to note is even with common carriers, historically there have been. Uh, at least some limited restrictions that the common carriers were permitted to impose. So think about a railroad. Um, historically, uh, and I presume today too, if you're drunk, you can't get on the train. You know, and the, the railroad is allowed to keep you off the train if you're drunk. Um, and so it's not, this is a somewhat amorphous concept in the common law of, of common carrier status, but it's the, even when you're dealing with a common carrier that has, in general, uh, a, a all comers, you know, we hold ourselves out to the public and make our services available to everyone status, e even those common carriers historically have, have had some exceptions to, to those, those all comers rules. Jonathan? One just final point, I think, to build on what Judge McConnell said, if that's, if that's the understanding that nobody thinks that we can have true, you know, even-handed common carrier take all comers, you know, approach to social media, um, especially if you're going to, uh, you know, apply that to speech that is, that would otherwise be, con user speech that would be constitutionally protected, speech that is not prescribable, then I think we're in hardcore First Amendment violation land. Like, the government cannot say, I like moderation for th this speech is disfavored and this speech is not, beyond, beyond the categories of speech that could be banned, right? I don't think the government can say, 
well, these sorts of things, you know, we don't like this sort of speech, so social media can, can moderate that, but all this other speech uh, cannot be moderated. I, I think that raises humongous First Amendment problems. And even if the government didn't do that, I, for the reasons I discussed, I think it would be unconstitutional. But certainly, you know, once you go beyond true, completely, you know, we let everything go through, then it's definitely unconstitutional. Thank you. Uh, on humongous First Amendment problems, perhaps, yeah. um, that might be a place to yeah. say I'm conscious we are what's standing between everyone and the cocktail reception. So while I see more questions, hopefully those can be answered over drinks. So thank you to our panelists um, for the robust discussion. Thank you.